me. Um, yes, we're doing our presentation in three very brief sections. I'm going to say something about climate change, and I will keep it brief on the basis that I'm sure you're all more than conscious of it already. Um, then Sam will do a section. Um, he, among other, is it, one of his main responsibilities is maintaining the Love Your Chelmsford website, which is where you can find out about, um, first of all, what, what, what things you perhaps ought to be doing if you're not already, um, and then how you go about them in the way of uh, recycling, coming forward as a volunteer, all sorts of things, but I won't steal his thunder by saying more about that. Um, and, and then he will pass back to me, hopefully, um, and I will then say a little bit about um, a particular recent um, development um, in the city that I'm sure you'll have heard of, but might be glad of a little bit more information about. Um, and obviously it will be up to you whether you want to get more information on it. I'm not going to go into any detail, but um, I'm sure one of our planning officers would be very pleased to come out and beat you um, should you, um, you know, think that would be helpful and appropriate, which it might be. Okay, so the first thing then, is, um, I'm going to say a, a quick few words about climate change. Um, which was one of the first topic, serious topic, that the City Council addressed after the change of administration in 2019. Um, there was um, a resolution put forward um, recognising a climate and um, uh, uh, ecological emergency. Um, and I'm um, delighted to say that having been rejected in previous years, it was actually adopted unanimously with thunderous applause from the gallery. Um, I think Extinction Rebe Rebellion were in, in force and um, anything green was greeted with applause. Um, and uh, in fact, they, yeah, well, I won't bore you with one or two little details, but um, so that was done and the council immediately began setting about the task of trying to go carbon neutral in its own activities by 2030. And you may have seen the electric vehicles in the parks replacing the petrol driven ones. Um, and uh, you, you may, uh, if you're an electric um, car user, you may already have used one of the um, recharging points which the city councils had put in, in various car parks. Um, and we're continuing those sorts of initiatives. Um, uh, so one target was to go carbon neutral by 2030, and the, uh, another related to it was the planting of 174,000 trees. And I'm pleased to report the first 30,000 or so are already in uh, with plans for more. I'm visiting a site in the morning where there are going to be more. Um, so what was this climate emergency we declared? I'm sure you're very familiar with the story. Um, a few years ago, there were still people who were in denial about climate change, uh, mostly people employed by um, the, uh, uh, the oil industry, I may say. Um, but um, I think what's happened is that uh, in recent years, it's become more cl clearer and clearer and we've also had David Attenborough doing his best to really get it across to people. Um, and he's made a remarkable job of that. Um, when he began um, filming back in the 1950s, he was able to record what we can now recognise as being still the Garden of Eden. There are many parts of the world quite unspoiled by man's activities. Uh, there aren't many now. Um, and um, it, one of the saddest things is that we have gone from the Garden of Eden to having to recognise that basically uh, modern man and modern Western man in particular has trashed the place. You know, we've burnt all these fossil fuels, we've made all this plastic, um, and now we have rivers cloaked, uh, absolutely choked with that plastic. Um, so 
really, it's a dreadful situation that we encounter. And it's an ecological emergency because in these circumstances, all sorts of species are at risk. Obviously, those rivers are not going to be very healthy places for fish, but you can name um, all sorts of species that you may all yourself know um, are in danger of extinction. Um, I used to uh, carry this image in my mind when I was thinking of trying of w whether I could turn the heating up and deciding I mustn't, that um, I was picturing the last polar bear on the last ice flow. But I thought of that as happening in 2030, 2040. But uh, thank you, Sam. Um, I'm afraid he's put in an appearance already. Um, this poor chap's already in a very bad way. Um, at the very least, he's hardly in peak feeling condition, is he or she? So um, we really have done a lot of damage. We have to recognise it and we have to take steps urgently to try to do something about it. Um, uh, got his ice melting at the poles as well, uh, while at the same time there are forest fires raging elsewhere. And the best thing to do, you could just despair, you know, hold your head in your hands and say how dreadful. But um, it's not in man's nature to accept defeat as easily as that. Um, and it's up to us all to begin to, uh, to begin, or hopefully we're already making contributions to beginning to improve the situation. Um, and we'll find out in due course, or at least some of you, the younger people attending may find out whether we've been successful by 2050. Um, so purposeful action is what's required. And I was appointed last summer um, as climate ambassador to help put the word around, because of course, we are in a minority here. Hang on, there's a policeman coming. I'm not sure what he wants. I think I'd better answer the door though. Oh no, he's just putting something through, through my door, that's all right. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, it's a strange day today. Um, yes, um, so uh, I made climate ambassador and I've done a number of things already in that connection. Um, one of the most valuable being contacting parish councils. We've got over 40 parish councils um, in, within the city boundaries. Um, and they are really operating at a level such that um, there are possibilities that they could encourage or facilitate themselves. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. So refocusing on the, um, the job in hand. Uh, oh, I was talking about the role of parish councils, wasn't I? And, um, for example, there are all sorts of um, people only too eager to uh, support parish councils if they try to develop community energy schemes, among other things. Um, so, um, yes, I have high hopes of what we'll be able to achieve that way, because I was just starting to say that the city council clearly is not in a position, is only accounts for, I think it's um, under 10% of all the emissions in Chelmsford. So even if we manage to achieve um, a 50 um, uh, uh, carbon neutral by 2030, that isn't going to do enough to change the situation in Chelmsford. Um, but others are already changing as well, of course, and we have to encourage and facilitate them. Um, and that will be part of my role in the next couple of years. Right, I think at that point, I will hand over to Sam um, to uh, uh, just spell out for you, any of you who, who aren't familiar with it, the nature of this website. Sam. Great. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So my name is Sam Warren. I work in the Lovely Chancellor team at Chancellor City Council. Uh, my main role, as, as Council has mentioned, was to, or is rather, to manage, I suppose, a lot of the community engagement side of the stuff that we do, um, which includes the website, our social media, but also uh, I run our litter picking volunteer program. Uh, I give talks, I suppose, to community groups and residents such as, Shell, uh, such as yourselves. And I also project manage a lot of the environmental campaigns that we do. So I'm also involved in creating videos and um, all sorts of content that ends up being released to the public and hopefully tries to get a good message across about uh, helping fight climate change. 
So Ludwood Chelmsford as a whole, the, the program works with residents, community groups, schools, local businesses, um, and, and pretty much anyone, I suppose, in the city to try to uh, improve the, envir the environmental quality of Chelmsford. Uh, we do this both through education, so informing our residents as to the environmental issues we face, uh, you know, doing talks such as this, but more importantly, we try to lead by example. We try to show what needs to be done and show that we are doing it ourselves, which is proven, I suppose, if, if nothing else, by our tree planting program. As Council Wish mentioned, um, we have committed to planting a tree for every resident, as well as three trees for a new house built in Chelmsford. So that puts us roughly at trying to plant 175,000 trees. And as Council Wish said, we're about 30 to 32,000 trees. Uh, planted up to this point, which is fantastic. We're, we're doing very well. And we, I think we're, we're on, pretty on schedule to, uh, to complete 175 by 2030. We do this through a number of different ways. So we have a volunteer program that's run by our Parks and Green Spaces Department. Uh, so we have regular volunteer groups that go out through tree planting, um, and that's on a weekly basis in various points around the uh, sort of borough and city of Johnsford. We also have a mass, uh, our mass greening events, which I guess have been obviously been put on hold over the last year or so. Um, we, did help, uh, we did have one in February last year, which went down very well, that was at Highlands. And we're hoping to recommence those, I suppose, later this year if restrictions are allowed. But despite all of that, we have carried on with our tree planting. Our dedicated team within the Parks Department have been planting trees day in, day out, um, pretty much every single day of the year. And that's fantastic, which is why we are doing so well and we, why we've already planted 30,000 plus trees. Alongside that, we also have our litter picking program, which is something that I uh, work in quite a lot. Um, this has been doing absolutely fantastic, particularly the last couple of months. Um, in March through to April, we had the same amount of uh, volunteers come and join us as we did in the entirety of 2020. So we've really had an influx of people taking part. And with this week being a Keep Britain Tidies um, Spring Clean, we've been seeing a huge amount of people out litter picking which is fantastic. And yeah, we're really managing to keep Chelmsford uh, to a very high standard. We do what we can as a council, but as residents, it's fantastic to have you guys on board. Um, so if you'd like to take part in any of those, yep, head to the Lovely Chelmsford website and I'll mention a little bit more about that uh, towards the end of my little bit. Alongside that, we run our education program. As I said uh, earlier on, it's very important that we educate and explain why it is we, do, to, we need to do the things we're doing. Um, a lot of people are already very much aware um, particularly young people, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't reinforce that, which is why we have our fun and learning section on the website, which had a whole lot of content um, put on there uh, sort of during the lockdown periods when there was a lot of homeschooling. Um, so we did a lot of content there, including our free foot festival, um, sort of, I suppose it was a, it was a cross team project. Uh, we put together this little pack alongside the people who put on the free foot festival and that went down fantastically well. We had a whole lot of downloads online. Um, and alongside that, we run our social media competitions. It's, we found the most, the most effective way of communicating um, the issues around climate change, particularly to younger people. Um, so we put a lot of work into that. And yeah, we run competitions regularly to try and, uh, try and keep the engagement up and to get people actively helping to fight climate change and understanding a bit more about it. Uh, an example of, of how that's worked and how that's gone through to kind of create change is um, these recycle on the go uh, piece of artwork that we've done. Uh, these will hopefully be going up on all of the uh, all of the bins around the city centre uh, in the coming months. Um, these pieces of artwork, as you can see, some of them are uh, kind of drawn and coloured in, uh, and they were actually done by young residents of Chelmsford. We sent a call out and asked for them to take part and to colour in some images for us. They sent them back to us, uh, and I had the fun task of putting all those together um, and kind of creating these montages. And we're hoping that um, we'll see a, an increase in the quality of the recycling we get, but um, I'll have to let you guys know how that goes once we get some uh, some information back. But all of this is talking about young people, sort of maybe perhaps uh, early teens and below, but we also try to target young people that are maybe getting started in their careers or thinking about what they want to do in life. So this is just one of the projects we run. We talk to various people in green career paths. Um, I've done quite a few of these interviews and we ask them how they got into their job role. Um, and we ask them to kind of give some advice to other young people. These are just examples of some of the work we try to do. It's examples of how you guys can take part and how we're trying to reinforce the idea of education as well as action together. Um, but yeah, all of that is kind of 
held and put together on the lovely Chancellor website. Uh, there's a section dedicated on there to green living, so improving uh, the way that we live our lives and giving small tips and hints as to how you could perhaps be more environmentally friendly and how you live your everyday life. There's sections on green living, learning about your local green spaces, the importance of them and how you can get involved in looking after those. And we regularly update it with news and stories, all sorts of other content. Um, so that's mostly about the programme. I'm, I'm going to kind of hand back to Councillor Willis in a minute to talk through uh, these, these points of planning uh, that, that we've got going on. But when we get to the Q&A section, um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions about anything really to do with sustainability in Chelmsford. So, yeah, back to you, Councillor Willis. Thank you very much. Um, right, I, th this is a section now. Um, uh, you can see what I'm going to be talking about. It's the um, new garden community that's being um, planned for the area north of Chelmsford, northeast to be accurate. And you'll see, uh, you'll recognise the um, Broomfield and Borum, and you'll see that the bottom corner of the new development is going to be very close to the um, interchange um, at Borum. Um, and these are sites which had been, uh, it or rather in, it incorporates sites which have already been um, cleared as committed development. Um, so there was committed development through um, uh, countryside uh, at the Borum side, and on the far side at Channels, um, there was um, a further uh, committed development um, adjoining the um, park and ride up there. So that's the area quite large as you see, and um, it, it, it's being developed not in the standard way, but as a garden community. And this is because the government is, has made funds available to try to encourage sustainable development. Um, and so this scheme is gonna have all sorts of green features in it. Um, and hopefully, because there's an element of government subsidy, the standard will be even higher than we can possibly expect from other new development. Um, and we do have high expectations of any new development. Just a quick word about current planning that you may not all be familiar with. Um, if the, if the uh, challenge is to preserve and enhance the environment while providing extra housing, and that is basically the challenge this is meant to be meeting, then um, what's the framework in which you can possibly do it? Um, apart, because uh, not all of schemes are gonna have government money coming in. Um, and there's, a, a, the procedure now is different from what it used to be. We have the plan, of course, you're familiar with that and the idea that there are so many houses, um, uh, space for so many houses that have to be allocated in the local plan. Um, and so every few years we have another round as we take in the next bit um, uh, and the next the targets for the next four or five years. Roughly about 8,000 houses a year have, it has been and it won't get less, I'm afraid. Um, well, uh, we have two particular mechanisms you may not be familiar with. First of all, the plan is supported by um, some, a, a suite of documents called strategic planning documents. And one of them is called Making Places and sets out our ambition for what we hope developers will achieve in terms of um, ecology, um, uh, you know, and care for the environment, green, uh, green spaces and so on. Um, and uh, uh, we will always expect a number of trees to contribute towards that target of 174,000 that uh, we haven't forgotten about. Um, so that's the aim of it. Um, and those, the, the, the guides we produce are to help developers in um, producing what's called a master plan for their particular area. Obviously small developments, you know, where you're just having 10 or 15 houses, this, it's a different procedure. But where there's a, approval given in the plan for significant development of a number of, um, you know, hundreds of houses, um, a master plan is, um, is expected, and that then informs the planning application. 
the whole idea being that when they come forward with the planning application, we already know exactly what's coming and be happy with it. So it, it can be put through quite quickly. Um, so master plans um, are submitted when they're ready uh, or in, 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 as, as they are developed, they are submitted to the, uh, the City Council's policy board. And I've made sure I'm a member of that, which means I can ask all sorts of questions, particularly climate related. Um, and my particular angle, um, uh, the planning officers will get quite bored with this, I'm afraid, but they know that I'll be asking, if it isn't apparent, I'll be asking what the provision is going to be for the heating of the homes, because of course this is a major uh, source of carbon emissions in Chelmsford, um, and therefore it, it, it's fairly critical. Uh, the, the central government has recognised the problem to the extent of saying that gas boilers will be obsolete from 2023, um, but um, it was interesting, the first time I asked the question, of a developer, and this was only, you know, obviously only in the last 18 months. Um, the first developer I was asking about their development plan and heating, uh, they clearly hadn't thought about it. Um, and uh, obviously realized that they were gonna to have to do some thinking rather fast. Um, you know, because, you know, some of, they'll still be building in 2023, and they really shouldn't be expecting to put in gas boilers. And the extent and the pace of change at the moment is very interestingly revealed here, because when I, this master plan was presented, in which they set out, you know, where the housing is going to go, where the green areas are going to go, um, um, they, um, there was a word which wasn't mentioned in the whole of their presentation, and it was the word gas. So um, I, I asked the operative question. I said, I, the one word I didn't hear you use was gas. Can I take it that you're not going to be providing a, an infrastructure of gas pipe work? And they said, no, we have no plans for gas. Well, game, set and match. If only all the developers from now on tell me that, I shall be a happy bunny. Um, they won't all, I don't suppose. but. Um, that is the, the sort of target we need to be achieving. And if we succeed, then, um, you know, it, suddenly the thing becomes a bit more credible, doesn't it? It will still only apply, of course, to new housing. There's the whole of the existing housing stock, poorly insulated and running on gas. Or if, they have, if you haven't got gas, it's probably oil, which is worse. Um, Anyway, so uh, th th this is the new development. It's going to include all sorts of green features. Obviously, it's going to come with schools and health services. Um, and it has to be of good quality to continue to attract central funding. It attracted some central funding to fund the development, development work. That's proceeding now. But if the, it then has to have features which makes the central government recognise it as one of the national um, you know, accredited schemes, which they will support further. So um, I thought you might like to, he to hear that. Sorry, I'll just get rid of that. Not now, thank you, sorry. Right, yes. Um, right, time I stopped, I think. But um, uh, I think, yes, I think I will. I, I, I've lost my train of thought. And I, I mean, I was at the end, really. So I think now's the time when we can invite you to ask questions um, and Sam and I will endeavour to field them to the best of our ability. Right, uh, currently F1 is muted. So if you do have a question, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, that'd be fantastic. Either that or I've talked everybody into submission. <laughs> What I would say, what is the alternative for a boiler then if it's not going to be gas boilers? What are they installing? The um, well, that will vary. In the case of new development, um, the, every, they should, what they should be looking at is ground source heat pumps. Yes. Um, because um, in new build, you can put in 
uh, you could take a, a full advantage of ground source heat pumps. Um, Even if you're in an apartment? Yes. You oh. have, yes. Um, you could still have ground source heat pumps. I mean, it's housing. Doesn't matter what the housing is. It can, um, uh, obviously, the the uh, technically there would be a, some additional uh, features that you'd need to be building in, but um, yes, it, it's perfectly feasible because there are community energy schemes where they have a facility which produces surplus electricity, and then you all the housing nearby is fed from that. And that sometimes it takes the form of hot water. Um, and if, if they can circulate hot water from that sort, the, those sorts of sources, they can certainly do it from ground source heat pumps designed for the job. So ground source heat pumps are, are probably the most efficient. Um, but obviously you have to identify the site where you're going to put in all the pipe work. And you need to do that from the beginning. That's why it has to be, and I think it's usually done with hot water pipes under the floor. And you can't put them in after the event. You know, if you've already got a solid concrete floor, you can't put hot pipes in retrospectively, or at least not, not very sensibly in terms of the cost and the practicality. Harry, uh, Harry has his hand off if you'd like to ask a question. No? Okay, Can I no just come, I'll come back briefly, if I may, on the, um, if not ground source heat pumps, then air source. Uh, they are also quite efficient, not quite as efficient as ground source, but um, they are also quite efficient. In fact, I put them in in my last house. I was on oil um, and managed to get off it by going over to um, air source heat pumps. Sam, can you see the question in the chat? Someone's typed one. Can you see that? I can indeed. I was about to bring that up. Oh, cool. Uh, no, just in case you didn't notice. Okay, no, no problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll read it out if you like, Council List. It says, uh, you mentioned about heating. Are you also looking at measures for sustainable water usage in building projects? Ah, oh, yes. That has been a feature, actually, of better projects for some years. Um, up in Cambridge, my, my son uh, um, is a planner. And while he was studying planning, he uh, studied some developments in Cambridge. And um, among other things, they had um, grey water facilities. You know, they, they had a, a, a huge tank put into the development so that all the um, grey water um, could be put into that. Um, uh, grey water, I think it, it would include any rainwater that comes in that way. And um, obviously it doesn't include what comes out of toilets. I think it does include what um, bath water and, you know, washing up water. I think that can go. And that water is then used to flush the toilets. So yeah. it's not available. Obviously, it's not drinking water quality but it's perfectly fine for flushing toilets. So if you could imagine a, a large block of flats and every flush is using gray water from the big tank underneath the building, or not underneath the building, but you know, underneath the adjacent site. Okay, good. Uh, I am I'm being told that Harry does in fact have a question if he, if he would like to uh, ask it now is the time. You've given me a question, actually, and that's my, the other question I could be asking, isn't it? What are they doing to um, recycle grey water? Yeah, good one. Harry, would you like to ask your question? Hello. 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 Yeah. Hello. I have a... Harry, Hello. Hello. Um, am I... Is it me you are suggesting a question? Yeah. I could... Yeah. I question and that is the cost of the ground floor water heater how does it compare with a gas boiler um uh, i ha haven't seen recent figures but i think you'll find it's comparable um the difference is it doesn't cost us the earth yeah. 
you know, okay. in a way. I mean, I think we've got past the point of saying, is it the cheapest on offer? No, the cheapest on offer is cheap and nasty, mm. um, as in all those plastic bottles. Mm. You know, um, and yes, it's very cheap, which is why the Far East is full of them, uh, just as full as, as we are, with less <laughs> facility for handling them. Yeah. So um, uh, it, it, it's not a question of what is cheapest. You can ask what's the cheapest of what is sustainable. And the cheapest of what is sustainable is ground source heat pumps. Mm. I'm okay. sure, um, Sam, um, mm. where would you look on the World Wide Web to get figures on that? I'm sure the information's out there, and I ought to know the answer, actually. It most likely would be uh, a good place to start would be to look at the various um, green utility bills that are available out there. Uh, starting there, you'd probably then be able to have a look at the various, um, I suppose, uh, di different websites and the different statistics that they have online there. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to try and mute the noise I'm hearing. I mean, I can certainly tell you, I can't do the comparison with gas, but I can do the comparison with oil. Yeah. My, um, my electricity bill um, at my old house, after I'd gone over to air source, air source heat pump, which are less efficient than ground source, mm. and the air source heat pump, the, um, the cost of the electricity was less than the cost of the oil. And oil and gas are only going to rise in price. Um, yeah. Apart from anything else, I think the government will, the government has protected heating oil and gas from um, being taxed. But I can, you can foresee a time when they, they will, it, you know, having offered us various carrots, they will then supply a stick in the form of saying, look, we can't afford to subsidize you. If you insist on continuing to burn gas and oil, that's entirely up to you, but you will pay, you know, um, yeah, uh, VAT uh, and on other things. I'll quickly say that Nikki Wilson just put in the chat that the, uh, the Energy, Energy Saving Trust website, and that is a very good point. I did forget about that. That's a great place to have a look. They, they definitely will have information um, and hopefully it should be up to date, um, although I, I don't, don't quote me on that. I haven't had a good look recently. Uh, are there any other questions at all? Yes. Of course. Um, I have concerns from the, the wider environment angle. One is covering the land with concrete and buildings and everything. We are storing up trouble, are we not, in the future, for getting enough rain down to the water table to sustain um, rivers, streams, plants indeed. So when there is a development coming on, surely everything that can be fed into um, soakaways into the water table uh, from roads, roofs, uh, playgrounds, etc., must be, or we are really storing up problems. And let's face it, Essex is one of the driest areas in the country. Quite, quite. Uh, no, you're absolutely right to raise the question. Um, and actually, one of the saddest developments in recent years has not been on new housing sites. It's all the people who have solemnly paved over their front gardens and sloped the whole lot down onto the road so the water goes straight to the drain. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And there's yeah. your flooding problem. You know, because I mean, you can go to streets in Chelmsford, even more in central London and elsewhere. And, you know, most of the houses have uh, could, you know, got have done this. And the consequence is um, the flooding, because the water reaches, um, you know, reaches the rivers so much quicker. Yes. Um, yeah. So the water does reach the rivers, it just does it at alarming speed if, the, if it rains heavily, which we also have now, of course. Yeah, but we've got to get it to the groundwater. That's the yes. crucial thing. The yes. other point which is tied into this is if we cover half the county in concrete, well, not quite half, you know what I mean? Yeah. Concrete and that, 
the one thing we are all going to suffer from is food shortages. Because even for um, Warren Farm to the west of Chelmsford, that's going to significantly, the loss of grain from that land is going to significantly reduce the number of loaves that can be made to feed the residents of Chelmsford. Oh, and yes. How yes. can we overcome this? Well, one thing we can do, um, I mean, there are a number of things. You're quite right. Um, I'm afraid we are in for food shortages, come what may, because of the changing climate. Um, I mean, I can tell you I'm a keen gardener and I produce a lot of fruit and veg. Um, and it's becoming much more challenging to produce that than it used to be because of the long, dry summers we get. Um, and they, you know, we've always had dryish summers um, in East Anglia, but um, you know, they've, it's got a lot worse, even since I've moved. Actually, um, you know, what I was able to do the first year or two, I know I can't do now. Or yes, I can do it, but I have to think carefully and do it in a part of the garden where there's a bit more shade, um, so that it won't dry out as fast. Yeah, but we can, change, really, um, we can change the techniques of agriculture and bring in new varieties that, say, for example, grow very well in Morocco. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yes, yes, you're but right. There's, there's got to be a sea change in attitude. Yes. Starting at the council level, this is parish council, city council, and national levels over the whole thing. It's you know, and doing it little bits by bits will not achieve anything. It's got to be done on a very, on a universal basis. Yes, thank you, dear. Yes, I mean, well, obviously, to some extent, this will be done through the agriculture industry. And you may be interested to know, um, you know, solar farms are being proposed here, all over the place. There, I think we've got four applications in, in East Haddingfield alone. Um, and um, the government has recently produced a document which is going to be extremely helpful to us because it's setting out what criteria should be used in assessing whether or not um, a, a particular solar farm proposal should be approved. And one of the criteria is the arable land. Good arable land is protected. Uh, the best land, grade one, grade two, um, I think uh, uh, grade yeah. one and grade two land are protected by this new guidance. Um, and um, since an awful lot of uh, agricultural land in Chelmsford and in neighbouring authorities is high grade agricultural land, yes. that's a steer to us that we should refuse many of these applications. Exactly. You know, solar panels are great, put them on top of people's houses. Um, uh, uh, so we will be expecting to see that as standard. And um, the government may make it, um, include it in building, big, uh, building regulations. They keep upping the building regulations. And I think soon any new build house will have to have green features in it. Well, they do in Germany already, don't they? I think they do, yes. Well, you see, the Greens have been in um, in um, power as a you know a minority party in government on several occasions, and they've been in a position to influence events. Um, and um, yes, you're right. Uh, the Germans are ahead of us in men a good many respects. And the other point you raise, which is perfectly valid, is this solar panels. Um, the solar farms are fine if they're in the right place and they don't affect things too much. For example, um, let's take Highlands Park. There are areas of Highlands Park which are hardly walked on by the public at all. Um, if you could put some solar panels there, raised off the ground so animals and plants and everything can grow underneath, it could be a wonderful wildlife area as well as producing um, electric power. Yes, the two are consistent. Um, yeah. I don't. I very much doubt if, as an authority, we will smile on the idea of doing it in a public park. But um, yes, it, it, you're right in in, um, in in general. 
yes. You drive along the Rittle Bypass and the couple of fields down there uh, for Highlands are just not used. So let's use them for something that is beneficial to the whole community. Agreed. I will, uh, I'll just mention that uh, Councillor Rose Moore has just put in the chat that an award-winning uh, SUDS scheme has been put in place on the new Beaulieu development, um, which alleviates flooding and allows the passage of rainwater into the earth below by incorporating broad green slash wildlife corridors. So there is uh, obviously something being put in place by planning to, uh, to alleviate some of that flooding concern. Uh, and also, I would mention interestingly on that point of um, farming, particularly in inner cities, um, in London at the moment, there's uh, a number of developments taking place, particularly in uh, railway arches, to uh, create what are basically factory farms. Um, they happen in various places in, in Asia already, particularly in bigger cities. But the idea being that you basically kind of create a, a shelved system which uses UV light to create the plants and it grows them up to four times faster uh, than it would in the field. Um, so you stack them on top of each other in shelves, you water them regularly. Um, and there's a company in London, and the name escapes me, but their mission, and they're doing very well, is to feed every school within the M25 uh, with food grown in their farm. And they, they are well on the way to achieving that. So within, within sort of inner city areas, um, that may be the way that perhaps we go. And it, I, it certainly is um, a cheap alternative, and it completely removes the carbon travel from other countries to bring in things like tomatoes, um, you know, other sorts of fruits and vegetables that are grown in foreign countries that we can't grow here yet. So that's something to, to bear in mind. Yeah. Uh, there any other questions at all? Oh, sorry, can, I, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Sure, of course. It's, uh, it's about um, reducing the amount of private car usage and increasing um, environmentally friendly public transport. And I don't think e-scooters necessarily is the answer. So, any comments on that, Tom and uh, Sam? Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Willis, would you like to would you like to mention anything on that one? Um, yes. Um, let's just reconstruct that use of the private car. Yes, uh, I've literally seen today. Uh, I haven't had time to read it, but it's come in from the county council, um, and there are proposals um, in uh, five urban areas, but including Chelmsford, um, to reduce car use um, in order to make it easier to cycle and to walk. So there we could expect to see, um, and obviously the two go together, because if more people are walking and um, cycling, then there, there are going to be less cars. Um, so that's the basis of it. But that that's the county council, which I would suggest is actually considerably less green or has been um, than, than we, we, we've become. But, um, you know, they are in, involved in that one. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see their proposals and see what the public reaction is. Um, the public reaction, going back, to, um, uh, rewinding for a moment, if we propose putting solar panels anywhere on um, Highlands Park, I think it would make the the noise that was being made about introducing parking charges there pale into insignificance. I mean, I think the uh, the row would be heard in heaven. You know, um, it would be an, an absolute eruption of fury. To to add on the point of uh, of private car use and travel, um, particularly in that new Beaulieu development, is a good example of where uh, cycle paths have been given quite a lot of thought and priority to ensure there's easy cycle paths in and out of the city centre to the surrounding areas. And also um, the Army and Navy roundabout, the flyover, as you might know, has been removed and uh, it most likely will not be returning. Um, but from what I understand uh, from our teams working on that, the priority and the focus is to encourage the use of uh, cycling and public transport rather than put focus on allowing uh, traffic to cross over that quickly. So the idea being that we reduce travel uh, we reduce use of private cars and we increase the, 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 I suppose, we try to persuade people and try to focus the development of the city on reducing private car uses and increasing public transport. So they go hand in hand, and hand in hand there. Yes, I mean, this city, like so many, has been absolutely blighted by the assumption for the last 60 years 
that increasing amounts of space have to be allocated to um, uh, to roads because of the um, increase in the number of private vehicles. Um, you know, the whole, I mean, uh, before I knew Chelmsford, but in the memory of some of you, I imagine, um, um, we had the development which included High Chelmer, that whole development um, running down um, from um, Duke Street, Market Street, going down. Um, that whole development replaced what were, I think, some perhaps dilapidated but nevertheless historic buildings. Um, uh, you, you, some of you listening will be more familiar with it than me. But uh, you know, mm -hmm. it was appalling what we had done then, and the back, our backs were turned on the rivers. Um, if you look at um, High Chelmer but also other new developments in the town centre. They actually were built with blank walls facing the rivers. The idea that rivers were something to appreciate and you know, take advantage of the potential to have views. No, 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 you put the storage at the back and the, the storage didn't need to have, um, uh, have windows. So you know, a blank wall would be absolutely fine. Um, so, you know, uh, we've really suffered in, in this city uh, over the years from the assumption that the, the private car is king, rather than thinking, how can we avoid this over-reliance on the private car? Nikki Wilson has a hand up if she'd like to uh, ask a question. Uh, yes, it's just, sorry, another one for me. Um, I was just interested in... Um, You've talked a little bit about community energy schemes, but whether there are other types of community based retrofit uh, projects, particularly, I suppose, around um, insulation. I know that was covered by some of the, the government schemes, but wasn't that accessible. And um, I've, I've participated in the recent Solar Together kind of bidding round, but it wasn't really suitable for my property. So I'm interested in other measures and um, and how the power of sort of bulk purchasing can make that more accessible to more people. Yes, um, I think you've put your finger on a major problem. How far it can be tackled through um, parish councils, I'm not sure, but it'd be well worth looking at. The, the essential problem is that retrofitting costs a lot more than getting it right in the first place which is why it's so important that the new build is done right. Um, I, I mean, I share your problem. I live in a house which is not, does not have cavity walls. So the heat loss through the walls is colossal. Um, and the only way I could, uh, you know, begin to seriously improve that would be to put, I think, um, a, a whole layer of cladding with a, you know, with its own little cavity inside um, and using all sorts of clever materials which are available now to um, insulate my walls. But um, I, I got one, I haven't looked into it in great detail, but I did get a quote from a company that was a, um, active in my area and they looked at the house and quoted me 10 to 12 grand. Well, at my age and stage, am I going to rush out and, and spend 10 to 12 grand when my heating bill, um, well, my heating bill alone is about 500 pounds a year. Uh, you know, it, it would take me 20 years to get a pay, payback and whether I'll still be here in, in 20 years, I don't know. Um, but even um, if I'm in the land of the living, um, I may not be where I am now. Um, I may quite likely have needed to move elsewhere. So, um, Yes, it's a, it's a tricky one. And um, of course, I, I mean, I could do it if I chose to, and I may yet do it, but a lot of people simply wouldn't have the means. You know, a lot of people in retirement, um, living in the older properties, as they so often do, um, they have the problem and they don't have the means themselves. And the government has, is not very forthcoming. If the government is really serious about retrofitting, it is going to have to find some significant money, but then everyone's telling the government to find significant money for all sorts of things. 
Um, I can't see this one coming through in the near future anyway. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but I'd be pleasantly surprised. There's another uh, method that I've seen used abroad, and that's small turbines in water, in streams and rivers. Um, you know, for example, the wood would take some. Uh, it's interesting wood. you should say that. The, the, um, the, where the um, combined rivers, Wid and Chelma, um, come out on the eastern side of the city centre, um, there is a weir. Yes. Before the lock at Springfield, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the lock um, at the end of the oh, canal, um, there, uh, um, on the river to the side of that, there's a weir. And that weir is going to have to be replaced shortly at considerable cost. And one of the possibilities would be that in the replacing feature to have something called an Archimedes screw. Yeah. And the physicists among you will know what that is. I can only imagine it. But um, there's, um, uh, uh, if we could get, I think we might well be able to source some other money for that, especially if it's not in the name of the city council, but in the name of um, uh, uh, perhaps a, one of the um, river uh, organizations. Um, and there's money available. I was at a, on a webinar at the beginning of this week um, looking into um, money available to support community energy schemes, but also schemes like that. Uh, well, that is community energy, of course, because I mean, if by installing the Archimedes screw, we take advantage of the, um, river, of the river, power of the river water, um, you know, that yeah. will be a significant achievement, I think. Yeah. So yes, I'm hopeful that we may be able to do that. I haven't had time to actually ask the necessary <laughs> questions, but I will put it about that, um, you know, I'm aware that there is money available to help. And we could actually take our, um, our predecessors as an example where they used tide mills. Yes, yes, indeed. And, you know, just think of a tide mill um, covering the estuary of the Crouch or the Blackwater. Yes. The sheer level of power produced there would be enormous. Yes, yes. And it's powered on the tide in and power on the tide out. Yes, yes, we've been we've been very slow as a country yeah. to harness hydropower of all sorts. I mean, but I'm I'm keen on tidal energy. You know, yeah. we've got some of the best tidal examples of strong tidal flows in the whole of the world, apparently in the UK. Yeah, um, and you know. Um, one of the big disappointments to me on the new Labour, they talked the talk about the environment, but they didn't do anything. If they'd spent money then on the basic research to, you know, harness hydropower, including um, tidal, um, we might have created groundbreaking industry in this country, which might have exported its technology around the world. Yeah. Instead, yeah, of, quite we right. still don't know how to do it. No. Yes, Pam, you have a question. Yes, I just wanted to ask about plastic. What happens to the plastic that that, <laughs> that is um, accumulated in Chelmsford? We don't send it off to Turkey, do we? <laughs> um, I'm happy to answer this on uh, Council List if you'd like. Um, the, the, so the recycling in Chelmsford, uh, unlike neighbouring boroughs, uh, we actually have our own recycling facility in Chelmsford. So uh, all of the plastic is uh, taken up by, by the crews from your, from your curbside. It's then taken to Freighter House, which is on the A12 Forum Interchange. It goes through our MRF, which is a material recycling sourcing facility, um, and it's then separated into various different types of plastics. Um, and we then sell that on to reprocessors who then take that material and they directly make that into new, new plastic products. That's the way it works. Uh, and the process of doing that is actually um, very effective for us as a council because we actually earn money by doing that because we're selling that product, it's a commodity. Um, that means that we have, we, we basically have 
more taxpayer money available for other um, areas of the council so we can invest in various different things. Whereas neighbouring boroughs um, actually pay uh, private companies to take that plastic away or any type of recycling such as Viola, a good example. Um, so that's the way that we do it in Chelmsford and it seems to be a very effective um, way of doing things. Um, there's lots of little tips about plastic. I don't know whether you know, but your milk bottle tops can go to Lush in the high street. They collect them and use them for their repackaging. Um, it's also good with milk bottles to fill them up with a cup of warm water and then they just shrink to nothing. <laughs> um, it's always thinking of these things, these tips, isn't it? But also I remember seeing a note from uh, Stephen Robinson about the black bin bags. And that it's is there a the system being changed now about the uh, bin bags? Do you, uh, what exactly do you mean? Landfill, landfill. He, I, um, I, I can I, read it out. Are you um, thinking of um, our change of policy, it, not of the black bins? Yes, uh, I mean, you may have seen something about that. I'm not sure about that. But um, certainly we are reducing the availability of the plastic bags, the big plastic bags in which we recycle plastic, because we were giving out rolls and rolls of the stuff, and people were coming into the civic centre for extra ones, and um, one of the consequences was they were being used for all sorts of purposes, um, nothing to do with the recycling of plastic. Oh, no. um, so, um, <laughs> Yes, it's it's a difficult topic, but we we there is a, a restraint now on the availability of those bags. It's still obviously uh, householders will still get a, enough for their personal use every week, every fortnight, but um, it just won't be quite as freely available. There won't be freedom hall, you know, to go and collect a, a roll of, of 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 the bags whenever you want one. Mm. I will. Uh, I will just add to that. Um, the, the, the if you would like more bags, if you have that issue, uh, or if you're recycling that much, you're uh, producing more than one bag uh, every two weeks. Then uh, clear plastic sacks are still accepted, and you can get clear plastic sacks um, at most uh, hardware stores like B&Q. You can get them online, and they are very cheap. So for the extremely keen recyclers out there, that is uh, the thing that we suggest doing um, as an alternative. Unfortunately, to not being able to just supply as many. Uh, clear plastic bags as, as we'd like to. Are there any other questions at all? Um, so I'm skipping through trying to see if anyone's got their hand up. No, it seems like there's no more hands at all. Um, forgive oh. me, it's Councillor Moore. I just Hello. referring to Pam's question around black bags going to landfill. Oh, and yeah. I I think this relates to the failure of the MBT plant in Basildon, which is an Essex wide processing plant for mechanical biological treatments. And it was intended very um, positively to remove anything in a waste stream that hadn't been placed in recycling um, and separate it. And then it would be um, basically burned for energy. Um, so on the surface it looked great, but unfortunately the plant wasn't built to the right specifications and failed. And as a consequence of that, Essex County Council, who commissioned this, have thankfully recently won a legal case. Um, and the outcome of that was the people who built and ran the plant have now gone into liquidation. So unfortunately Essex County Council won't be receiving anything in damages. Um, and the consequence of this is that there is now a landfill area um, I think close to Colchester, into which every bag of black waste is being tipped. Um, so that makes the the idea of recycling even more relevant and vital. Um, and we're not sure of a long-term solution, but that really is in the hands of County Council to determine. I think that that was probably the article to which Pam was referring that Councillor Robinson has posted. Yes, I, I should perhaps explain the um, the city council has the or the local authority in this case the city council um, has the responsibility of collecting. It's the county council which has to decide what to do with it or when it when it reaches them, um, and hence uh, Councillor Moore's update on the. the uh, somewhat awkward situation in which the city uh, the county council finds itself. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Councillor Moore. I'm skipping through again. Any other questions? 
before we wrap up. Hi, I just had a, a quick question. It was regarding sure. recycling. Um, in my area where I live, it, the recycling is pretty poor. And I think it's around basically people not knowing exactly what to what is recycled and what isn't, especially in regards to different types of plastics. And I think in the end, they, they get too confused and then they end up putting it in the black bags anyway. Is there anywhere a kind of where I could direct them to a, a central place for them to find out exactly what in their local area is recyclable? Um, and what isn't? I don't know if there's anywhere central they could look at online. So uh, within Chelmsford, uh, we encourage you to go to our own uh, Chelmsford City Council website where there's a section that you can look through and see exactly what can and cannot be recycled in our recycling services. But that does differ um, from borough to borough because each borough has its own recycling type. Um, so the best thing I would, I would suggest is to go onto your local council website see what they've got on there about recycling in their area that should be able to give you uh, the information but certainly in Chelmsford even if you don't go and look on our website um, we do um, we have in the past given out uh, leaflets and stuff like that um, which give very detailed information about what can and can't be recycled but we have cut down those because well it's on the website it's available we don't need to cut down more trees and uh, print out more paper yeah. um, so that, that's why I suggest go to your local council website and see what's on there yeah, OK, I'll give it a check. I, I think I have been on the City Council one before, but as you said, it seems to sometimes say, oh, check with your local area, like yeah. your local borough. Um, mm. And some of it's a bit missed. But yeah, I'll have a look online and see if I can see something directly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But, but you're right, it does vary. And it's very unhelpful that um, something that's possible in Chelmsford may not be in Braintree or Malden. Um, you know, really, the whole nation should be moving as one. Um, it's one of the um, more unfortunate consequences of local government. I'm all for the principle of subsidiarity and, you know, things being done at the lowest um, possible level. But um, the consequence in this case is uh, very, very different patterns in adjacent boroughs must be very confusing for people who, you know, there are roads where one side of the road is in one authority and the other side of the road in another. Um, hopefully they get together and each take advantage of what the other one is good at. <laughs> Little bit of crisscrossing of the road from time to time to distribute the uh, rubbish to where it will be dealt with best. Absolutely. Okay, uh, any more questions at all before we wrap up? Okay, fantastic. Um, if that's everything, then uh, thank you very much for attending, I suppose. Uh, Council Wiss, would you like to say anything before we wrap up? No, I don't think so. He said thank you for your time and being, um, you know, uh, uh, following and intently what we've been saying. And um, if, if uh, there are further queries in your mind, don't hesitate to ask. Um, and as I say, if you want some more specialist information, for example, about new developments, our planning department, I'm sure, would be only too pleased to help. Thank you. Thank you Everyone much. will agree that um, it's been a very good presentation. I think we've learned a lot as well. I certainly have. I've made lots of notes. Um, we do thank you both very much for coming today. Um, and uh, if there are any more thoughts or questions, we can always feed them into you. But um, uh, I'd like everybody, if we would, just give a clap to Tom and Sam. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks. Many thanks indeed. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.